Greeting to, greetings to all the participants of this international conference and I'm thankful to Professor Samiran Mandal for making me a part of this conference. As we all know, yoga is becoming popular and the popularity is, of yoga is gaining day by day. The application of yoga is particularly useful in the field of health and wellness. <clears throat> but when we apply yoga for the purpose of improving health or managing certain diseases, we should be careful because <clears throat> there is always a chance or risk for adverse effect if we don't apply yoga properly. To avoid this adverse effect or harmful effect of yoga, if we don't apply, apply properly, the best way is to depend or base uh, our intervention on scientific understanding about yoga. To apply yoga with scientific understanding not only removes the risk of adverse effect, but the efficiency or effectiveness of the yoga intervention will increase if we understand yoga from scientific viewpoint. <clears throat> Today's presentation will be about neurophysiology of yoga and the presentation will be based on what are the evidences available <clears throat> at present. So let us see the evidence of neurophysiology of asana. Asanas are yoga postures. <clears throat> there are many studies on yoga asana. Most of them use combination of asana as intervention. And there are few studies which have, which have evaluated the effect of specific asana. Here I will discuss a few important studies. <clears throat> The first study which I am uh, going to discuss is the study conducted by Chris Streeter and group where they studied the effect of yoga asana on gamma amino butyric acid. Gamma amino butyric acid is a neurotransmitter which inhibits over excitation of the neurons in the brain. It is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it helps in prevention of anxiety and in other conditions also like attention deficit hyperactive disorder ADHD etc. <clears throat> in the study which they conducted in 2007 they found out that expert yoga practitioners have high and increases uh, gamma amino butyric acid after practicing asana. This publication uh, there were a few arguments about this presentation. The main argument were, how do we know that asana is, yoga asana is producing the effect or the physical ac uh, activity involved in yoga asana is producing the change. So they conducted an another study and they published in 2010. This study was a randomized control study they have two groups uh, one was yoga group and another was physical activity group and <clears throat> the two group practice the exercise intensity was kept same so after practicing yoga asana for 60 minutes there was increase in gamma amino butyric acid but there was no change in the level of gamma amino butyric acid or gaba in the physical activity group hence the change in the level of gamma amino butyric acid is not caused by the by physical activity but there is a uh, component in yoga which can bring this change the speculation about this component is that the slow and rhythmic breathing involved in yoga asana might cause the change because Slow and rhythmic breathing 
activates effer vagal efferents. So vagal efferents gives relaxation to our system and which might have caused the change of GABA levels in the brain. So vagal efferents induced by, uh, induced by slow and rhythmic breathing during asana might cause the change in the level of gamma amino butyric acid. So it is very important when we practice asana, we should take care that our breathing is regular, slow and rhythmic. <clears throat> Another interesting finding is that yoga asana promotes better connectivity in cortico vessel ganglia thalamic loops. This study was also conducted on expert yoga practitioners, those who are expert in yoga asanas, <clears throat> and it was a neuroimaging study where they found that connectivity in the cortical vessel ganglia thalamic loops were greater compared to those people who are not practicing yoga asana. <clears throat> this loop, cortical vessel ganglia thalamic loop, is involved in activities which have component of body awareness and procedural learning. When we practice asana, body awareness is an important component, uh, component and procedural learning is an important aspect of performing an asana. So when we practice asana, cortical, cortical vessel ganglia thalamic loop is activated and this loop is involved in higher brain function, the higher cognitive functions and social behavior of a person. So there is a chance or there is a possibility that if we practice yoga, our higher brain functions will improve, our cognitive ability will improve and our social behavior will also improve. So these are evidence which suggests that yoga can give, uh, yoga can induce <clears throat> or promote relaxation by increasing gamma amino butyric acid and improve our lifestyle, improve our social behavior, cognitive function through improving the connectivity in cortical vessel ganglia thalamic loops. <clears throat> Next, we'll move on to neurophysiology of pranayama. There are many studies which have shown that pranayama can increase parasympathetic activity. As we all know, parasympathetic activity induces or promotes relaxation and sympathetic activity makes us alert, helps us in fighting stress. <clears throat> so there are many studies which I have quoted only one. Pranayama which involves slow and rhythmic breathing can increase parasympathetic activity. The studies uh, they use to evaluate autonomic function in this study, they use heart rate variability, blood pressure, etc. <clears throat> And another study, which was published in 2008, found out that left nostril breathing reduces sympathetic activity and right nostril breathing increases sympathetic activity. This is very interesting because in Hatha Yoga, left nostril is always is associated with cooling lunar part. It is known as Tha. And right nostril is associated with sun or heating or activating part. So in this study, what was mentioned in the traditional Hatha Yoga text, we can see in through scientific uh, evaluation that left nostril breathing actually reduces activa uh, activation by reducing sympathetic, sympathetic activity. And right nostril breathing increases sympathetic activity. That means it activates our system. One of the important Hatha Yoga texts, Siva Swaradaya, mentions that when the left nostril is dominant, dominant we should do calming and relaxing activity like re reading. And when the right nostril is dominant, we should perform activating activities. 
So what has been mentioned in uh, the traditional text can be scientifically validated. <clears throat> and here we'll see the effect of uh, various pranayamas or breathing practices on P300 web. P300 test. P300 test is a neurophysiological test. In this test, we study the response of the neurons of our brain while performing a task which requires attention. In a way, our brain is stimulated. It, the stimulation can be auditory or through the ear or visual, through the eye. <clears throat> Most of the studies done on yoga and P300 is auditory evoke potential through the stimulation is through the ear. By making the participant listen to, the, to a certain type of sound. <clears throat> there is a uh, specific way of administering the sound. Uh, we use the auditory oddball paradigm. I, I will not go into the detail of that. So the person will ask the person to listen to the sound and to count a specific type of song. When he counts, he is giving attention to the stimulus. <clears throat> so when he gives attention to the stimulus, we get the P300 wave. P300 wave means nothing but <clears throat> the highest positive wave, P stands for positive, around 300 milliseconds. The highest positive wave, around 300 milliseconds. From this is the point of stimulus, this is regarded as the baseline and First, we get a negative wave, then a positive wave, again a negative wave, and the highest peak positive wave, we get around 300 milliseconds. This is known as P300 wave. Two things are important in this graph. One is latency and another is amplitude. Latency is the time taken from the point of stimulus to the point where this P300 web, P3, highest P3 web appears. <clears throat> so this is the time taken for the highest positive web to appear. This is correlated or this gives an idea about the efficiency of the neurons, how fast the neuron can transfer information. And another is amplitude, the height of the P300 web, the amplitude. It gives the neuro, neuronal resources available while performing that task. The new neurons or the resources of our brain available for performing that task. So two things are important, latency, time taken by the neurons to transfer the uh, stimulus and the amplitude, the neural, neuronal resources available during this task. <clears throat> so what are the findings? The findings is that alternate nostril yoga breathing, which we popularly know, known as Narishuddhi Pranayama or Anulom Vilom Pranayama. Narishuddhi, uh, here we do without uh, breath holding. Alternate nostril yoga breathing can increase peak amplitude in P300 tasks. As I mentioned earlier, Amplitude signifies the neuronal resources available during the task. So the more neurons are available, that means the task becomes easier. So alternate nostril yoga breathing can make a attention task becomes more easier. This is the interpretation of this finding. And high frequency yoga breathing, although it is not a pranayama, it is uh, breathing uh, practice involved in yoga it is popularly known as kapal bhati uh, as it is a breathing practice practice i have included in here uh, high frequency yoga breathing or kapal bhati decreases latency in p300 p300 talks that means the time taken uh, to uh, by the neurons to carry the uh, signal reduces that means the efficiency of the neurons increases with this finding, we can say that if we practice pranayama, 
particularly anulom bilom pranayama, alternate nostril yoga breathing and, and high frequency yoga breathing, our brain becomes more efficient. The neurons becomes more efficient and there are more resources available in our, uh, in our brain to perform as a, uh, attentional tasks, a task which requires attention. <clears throat> And next, we, I'll be presenting about a study on functional near infrared spectroscopy and uh, uh, pranayama. Functional near in infrared spe spectroscopy is a uh, is becoming popular uh, popular to uh, evaluate the hemodynamics of the brain. <clears throat> in this equipment, there are two things. One is the source. And another is a detector. The source emits a light at the wavelength of infrared, near infrared. It emits a light. It is placed on the skull and it emits a light. And it goes through the skull and it reaches the brain. So when the light hits the blood vessels of the brain, the reflected light the wavelength of the reflected light will de depend on the structure of the red blood cell or oxyhemoglobin <clears throat> the structure of the hemoglobin which are carrying uh, oxygen and which does not contain oxygen are different <clears throat> since the structures are different the reflected light from the blood will be different in wavelength. So with this mechanism, they, this instrument calculate the amount of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin in the blood. And this reflects the activity of the brain in that particular area. So when there is an increase in activity of uh, brain tissue, uh, neurons, the oxygen, oxygenated hemoglobin will increase in that area. And if there is a reduction in activity in a particular area of the brain, there will be reduction of oxygenated hemoglobin in that area. <clears throat> so through this mechanism, they calculate, this instrument is able to calculate which area of the brain is activated and which area of the brain is not activated. This study, they found that functional near infrared uh, study, so contralateral effect of uninostril breathing. This means if we breathe in or if we do the breathing through right nostril, the left hemisphere of the brain will be activated. And if we do breathing through the left nostril, the right hemisphere of the brain will be activated. <clears throat> Next, we'll move on to neurophysiology of meditation. Meditation can increase attention and enhance efficiency of brain resource allocation with greater emotional control. <clears throat> meditation can increase, we all know, but there is, uh, what I'm saying is that there is um, scientific evidence and efficient, enhance efficiency of brain resource allocation. We all know that our ability or capacity of the brain is limited. It is not unlimited. So if the allocation of the resource, brain resources available in the brain is efficient, our brain will become efficient. If the resources of allocation, uh, if the allocation of the resource in the brain will, is not efficient, if it is not controlled, if it is easily distracted, then our brain it will not be efficient. So when we practice meditation, this ability to allocate the resources available in our brain becomes easier to control. So as a whole, our brain efficiency of the brain increases with greater emotional control. There is greater ability to control our the feelings uh, in a uh, more efficient way if we practice meditation. <clears throat> And the next study which I am going to present is uh, also very uh, interesting. 
they found out that expert meditators have higher volume of gray matter compared to non-meditators of the same age group. <clears throat> that means the percentage of gray matter is higher in expert meditators compared to non-meditators of the same age group. <clears throat> gray matter is very important because it involves in memory and higher brain functions and According to as as we as our as our age increases our um, life uh, proceeds it the gray matters deteriorates and decreases. <clears throat> Here they have found that of the same person in the same age group the gray matter is higher in those people who are practicing meditative meditation and compared to those who are not practicing meditation. So there is a possibility that meditation can help in preventing age-related disorders of the brain by preserving the amount of or preserving or increasing the amount of gray matter in the brain. So with this, I'll end my presentation i hope uh, uh, some useful things uh, um, people are finding it useful and uh, once again i'm thankful to professor samir mandalji for uh, inviting me <clears throat> thank you <clears throat>